Hi, this is Mrs. Martin, and this is First Chapter Friday. Uh, this Friday's selection is Geek Fantasy Novel, which is actually written by Elliot Schriefer. Uh, he wrote it under a pseudonym or a fake name, E. Archer. Uh, but the author is actually Elliot Schriefer, and because it's Elliot Schriefer, you are able to use this as one of your summer reading selections for eighth grade. Uh, so let's read the back of this book and take a little bit of a look at what this story is going to be about. Be careful what you wish for, really. Wishes are bad, very bad. They can get you trapped in a fantasy world full of killer bunny rabbits, evil ants, and bothersome bacteria, for example. But you already knew that, didn't you? Ralph, alas, does not. He's been asked to spend the summer with his strange British relatives at their old manor house in order to set up their Wi-Fi network. But there's much more to it than that, of course. It's just that nobody told Ralph. He's a gamer, sure, but this game is much stranger and funnier than anything manufactured by Nintendo. So put on your suit of armor, take out your 20-sided die, brush up on your Warcraft, or at the very least, open up this book. Geek fantasy awaits. And then down here, the geek shall inherit the mirth. Basically, the geeks, they have a good sense of humor. You'll notice as you go through this book, that there's a lot of different sections that are marked off for us by the author and each section is made up of several chapters. The first section which we're going to be reading from today is called boring but important. So the author is putting it out there nothing you know on the edge of your seat is going to be happening in this section but it's all the background stuff that we need that we usually get in the onset of a story. So you're going to see some main characters, the setting, uh, and they're going to set things up for you. Uh, the second section of the book is called Cecil's Wish. Cecil is actually our main character, Ralph's cousin. Uh, section three is Daphne's Wish, also a cousin of our main character. Uh, section four, Beatrice's Wish. Beatrice, another cousin of the main character. And then the last section is Private Lives of Narrators. And basically the Private Lives of Narrators section is because our narrator, much like in the Lemony Snicket series of Unfortunate Events books, the narrator sometimes speaks out of turn and gets involved. So uh, you get to see a little bit of that. So they give you a family tree. Our main character, Ralph, is in the lower left corner. His parents, Mary and Steve Stevens, live in New Jersey and have really separated themselves from Mary's family. And that's the side of the family tree that we're looking at right now. So uh, Mary has a sister named Gert, a sister named Chessie, and had a sister, uh, oh no, I'm sorry, she doesn't have a sister. She, she has a nephew that died uh, also, or is presumed dead, also named Maurice, okay? Um, it's not really clear on the family tree because it's divided up this way digitally, but in the actual book, you would see these pages side by side. Annabelle is actually Beatrice's mother, although Beatrice is still Ralph's cousin because, uh, you know, step family. So there you go. So basically, what do you need to know? You need to know that Ralph is our main character. Cecil, Daphne, and Beatrice are his cousins, which I think we covered. Let's continue. Book one, boring, but important. Wishes are dangerous. Or at least that's what Ralph's parents had always told him. After all, why should a random fairy grant a child power out of nowhere? Because, say, the child had wastefully tossed a coin into a fountain. Childhood, Ralph's parents informed him, was all about learning your limits, not learning your limits only to break them in one spectacular moment for all the wrong reasons. Ralph believed his parents, but he remained curious. His parents kept the family tree hidden under their bed, wedged so far behind the dusty holiday decorations that Ralph had to be careful not to set off the dancing Santa when he sneaked it out. He'd creep back into his bedroom, secret himself under his superhero comforter, and tremulously unfold the parchment. It was a lengthy and complicated thing as trees go, with many wild touches. Branches ended abruptly, marked with skulls and crossbones and labeled with cryptic phrases like nasty cauldron accident or whoops, dangling modifier or whoomp by dragon tail. All until it got to the most recent century where the deaths were labeled with words that 
still sounded magical, but were actually commonplace, like aneurysm and metastasis. Steve and Mary Stevens were not the sort of parents to make a lot of rules. They didn't need to, because their son wasn't the sort of boy to need them. Ralph had always been a peaceful child. Some might have even called him happy, but had anyone sat him down and asked him whether such a thing were true, which incidentally no one ever had, that person would have discovered that he was an awfully serious boy. He would have replied that he'd always felt directionless, that even the most clever of minds couldn't piece his life together in such a way as to produce meaning. And Ralph certainly didn't have the most clever of minds, much as he may have believed otherwise. In a boy of average looks and below average athletic ability, cleverness was simply the one attribute relatives could find to compliment him on. So his self-esteem grew a little out of whack. Seven years old, he challenged the Ukrainian kid in his class to a lunchtime game of chess, dared Becky Pfister to finish the Belgian Bears book before he did, and argued passionately with his teacher that Portland was the capital of Oregon. Ralph failed in all these things. The Ukrainian kid trotted out a textbook four-move checkmate. Becky Pfister finished the last strudel while Ralph was still on Boofer Makes a Bungle. And his teacher made him look up the capital of Oregon, which was, in fact, Salem. Despite such defeats, Ralph had something many of his classmates did not have, permission to make mistakes. Ralph's mother and father never punished him when his so-called cleverness led him astray. As when, for example, vapors from his homemade chem lab eroded the floorboards and caused the dining room to tumble into the basement. They were, in fact, endlessly tolerant, except when it came to their one ironclad rule. Ralph must never, ever make a wish. Not under any circumstances whatsoever. As a result, for the first nine years of his life, Ralph was blissfully unaware of what his peers were doing whenever they spied the first star of the night or caught an eyelash or ripped apart a turkey's Y-shaped furcula. That's the little wishbone. Once fifth grade came around, though, the school calendar finally shook out in the right way that he could celebrate his birthday on the very first day of class. His parents sent him to school with two dozen chocolate frosted cupcakes, along with a sealed note to his teacher informing her that while the Stevenses were happy to provide treats for Ralph's birthday celebration, he was to sit out in the hallway for the whole thing. The risk of someone's adding a candle and peer pressuring him into making a wish was just too great. The first day of school is an ordeal for anyone, but it was especially hard for Ralph, who had to wait in the hall, staring at a school is cool poster, a bespectacled worm emerging from an apple, while everyone inside ate his cupcakes. His humiliation only grew when he found out that while he was outside, Johnny Keynes had gotten into the secret pocket of Ralph's backpack and pilfered the portrait of an, a level eight paladin, whom Ralph had spent a great amount of time sketching in case he ever came across anyone willing to play a role-playing game with him. The character's life story was written on the back and was soon lampooned in big graffiti and pasted on the wall of the classroom where a stream of cupcake-eating cretins shuffled past and made fun of the missing birthday boy's hero. Sir Laurel Brow was of a forgotten order of lamp knights, responsible for journeying the realm and spreading their light, both ideologically and literally, following a lonely quest until the day the lamp knights would rise again, aided by the priestess of Julian Retha. Julian's Retha, geek. Should they ever be awakened from their slumber by the suitable sequence of magical ruins? Magical ruins? Woo, woo. So basically, Ralph invented this character and its backstory, and his friends found it and made fun of him. 
When Ralph returned and saw his hero smeared with marker and spitballs and chocolate icing, he ran from the room seeking refuge in the nurse's office. Through the glass cylinder of tongue depressors, he could spy a corner of the infirmary's door's chicken wire window, at which Johnny Keynes regularly found reason to peer, sneer, and leer. Sir Laurel Bow, before bolting away. Laurel Bow, Ralph thought angrily. Why couldn't I have named him Sir Commando? Sir Heart of Steel. Once he got home, Ralph typed out a spreadsheet of arguments he could draw from to convince his parents how very cruel they had been. Foremost among them, of course, if they had let him make a stupid wish, he'd have been saved massive humiliation and pain. The Stevenses read the spreadsheet, listened politely to their son's accompanying rant, served him a pair of chocolate frosted cupcakes Mary had placed in the bread box that morning precisely in case Ralph had felt left out at school. And then they gave him the talk. The reasons for his parents' wish prohibition was far more gruesome than anything Ralph had anticipated. Wishes, they told him, had destroyed many of his ancestors. Those who hadn't been destroyed were maimed, crippled, hobbled, enfeebled, deranged, or made to disappear. The examples they used to make their case were certainly graphic. Margaret Battersby, who was born in 1750 and died in 1761, had wished for money and wound up with a coin-shaped tunnel through her body after a gold piece was shot at her from a cannon. Xavier Battersby, Battersby, born 1752 and died 1761, had wished for his sister back, wound up with Evelyn's rotting backside affixed to his own and died of infection. Amy Quaylen, born 1819 and died 1841, had wished for children and wound up financially ruined because she was deeded an orphanage built over a sinkhole. Rupert Battersby, born 1830 and died 1894, had wished for peace in Europe and caused Prussia to disappear entirely. Sigmund Seinhold, born 1899 and died 1917, had wished to be better at rugby and kicked the ball so hard at his next game that it disemboweled three teammates. Bethany Held, born 1940 and died 1949, had wished for magic ponies, gone on a long quest to find them, and finally wound up squashed beneath magic ponies. The ends of most wishes, the Stevens' family finished sadly, were less dramatic, but equally tragic. The child never returned, lost forever, on a quest to obtain his or her heart's desire. Thoroughly swayed by his parents' parade of gruesome examples, Ralph gave up on wishes and settled on hard drives instead. He played as many computer games as he could, tinkering with them and developing his own mods and maps and dungeons. He even, unbeknownst to anyone else, applied to the holy grail of jobs, the only job he ever really, really wanted. Video game designer. Not a programmer, mind you, but a designer. The guy who dreams it up and puts it all together then sees his vision fulfilled by millions of kids mashing buttons at his command. And not at just any company, at Monomyth, the one with all the coolest licenses and long-running franchises designed simultaneously for all platforms. Monomyth had famously employed a teenager to develop the best-selling Goddess of Misery line of console games, and Ralph was sure that someday he could best even that. Yes, Ralph was only 14, but he had a programming portfolio to dream of, a sheer full of game concepts inked into bent spiral notebooks and a flash drive's worth of code. What had the ad in the back of Computer Gamer said? Monomyth, seeking designer with intimate knowledge of electronic gaming industry, three to four years programming experience and employment history reflective of capacity to helm high profile projects. Check, check, check. Surely the genius of Ralph's ideas would make up for his lack of any employment history beyond mowing lawns. He assembled all his samples. They filled a little shoebox that he wrapped in brown paper and banded twice over in packing tape and mailed them off well before the deadline. The monomyth rejection letter 
a fuzzy photocopied slip of paper addressed to applicant, suggested he reapply as an entry-level software coder. At the bottom of the letter was a scrawled blue consolation. Appreciate the breadth of your work, but find that your otherwise adequate preparation would be assisted by more life experience. Attending high school, for example, suggests you steer your efforts in less derivative directions. Derivative? Who could find the green wizards of Cartesia derivative? or the subtle group dynamics of the elementalists. Could anyone read his description of the final boss fight in The Chosen Four and not realize that gamers having to hit Lord Lavish's thighs in order to kill him was the most unexpected development in gaming history? Derivative indeed. More life experience indeed. Ralph was about to wish some very bad things upon the men and women of Monomyth, but stopped himself just in time. No wishes and no job. A murky, geeky despair filled his soul. Luckily, or not so luckily, depending on whom you ask, another letter arrived the day after the horribly thin envelope from Monomyth. It was a card from the long lost British side of Ralph's family. He'd never received a card before. He raced back from the mailbox, put his backpack down on the kitchen table, and read the card over ramen noodles and cocoa puffs. Ralph, I hear from my Cecil, who happened to do a web search on you and found your blog, that not only are you alive and well, we never hear a peep from your parents, are they scared of us, but that you're applying to design your own games. You must feel so very proud of yourself to have developed so interestingly, despite such murderously dull parents. I do hope that you don't mind that I wrote that. One never knows quite how to phrase things in such situations. I know it's been a long time since you've seen us, but in any case, we have a request. We've moved back into our remote old castle. Little Daphne calls it a chateau, as if she's ever really seen one. Can you imagine? And the walls are crumbly and the electricity's bad, but... Nonetheless, we're intrepidly trying to get a wireless network set up. Do you smell a challenge? We need someone to come and be our tech guy for the summer. Sound like anything you'd be interested in? I imagine you have to set your charming games in castles all the time. You could call it research. We'd pay, of course, your travel expenses and beyond. I've purchased you an open date ticket, redemption info enclosed. I know we could get someone nearby to do it but honestly can you imagine a local bloke being any good at this stuff i can't either and my own children live in the clouds all your all the best your auntie gert battersby had ralph allowed himself to believe in fantastic fulfillments of fate he might have seen the timely receipt of the card as evidence of some higher power but as it stood he saw gert's card as a lucky break he emailed immediately and accepted the offer. And then he wondered how or if he was going to tell his parents. Okay, folks, so that takes you a little bit past chapter one and a little bit into chapter two. Um, you know, in the beginning, Ralph is a regular kid who lives in New Jersey with his parents. Um, when he does make the trip over to England, things take a real twist towards the fantasy uh, realm of things. So those of you who enjoy things that include, you know, magic and, uh, you know, monsters and, you know, I'm thinking of your like C.S. Lewis, Lion, in, Lion, the Witch in the Wardrobe or your Harry Potter books or your, um, like the, even the Lord of the Rings books. Um, this is kind of that kind of thing. Ralph, unbeknownst to Ralph is about to go on some pretty big adventures and they're pretty strange to boot. So this gets you a little bit started into the book. If it sounds like something you would like, it is one of the five Elliot Schrieffer books that you are allowed to read for eighth grade summer reading this year. So you might want to give this one a shot. Um, the other books are decidedly different, and I will uh, set you up another first chapter Friday next week so that you can hear the beginning of the Endangered series which uh, takes up about three of the books that you are recommended for you um, 
from the Elliott Schrieffer list for your eighth grade summer reading, okay? Um, as always, if you have any questions for me, you wanna chat, uh, you can hit me up on uh, email or you can fill something out in the checkout form. I'll talk to you.